So just as a reminder for everybody who has logged in already, um, this webinar is being recorded. So if you miss anything, it will be posted to our Conservation Nebraska YouTube channel in just a few weeks. So you can always click back and rewatch if you have any questions you want to retouch base on. And I'll just do a pretty brief introduction. Um, my name is Ashley Stolman. I'm one of the Northeast Region Conservation Nebraska um, Conservation Directors. And we're so excited to have you all here. Um, very excited to hear from Chris and his presentation about the sort of work that he's been working on. Um, and just a couple of reminders before we get started, everyone is muted and all of your cameras are off so you cannot be seen or heard. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to just pop them in the chat box. And if we have time, we'll go over them at the end. Um, and then lastly, at the very end, there will be a short poll that will pop up on your screen with just a couple of questions. These help us um, improve our future webinars and events. And you'll also be entered into a prize pool for a chance to win a $25 Visa gift card. We just have to make sure that you complete those polls to for sure be entered. But um, yeah, last but not least, welcome Chris Hobza. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yep, you got it. Nice, nailed it. And we're very excited to hear from you and kind of talk about the drought resilience of water in Nebraska. Uh, can you hear me all right? I just want to make sure before I get started that volume's okay on my end. Yep, sounds good for me at least. Okay, okay, very good. Okay. Well, I actually just introduced myself. Uh, I'm Chris Hobza. Um, I'm a lead groundwater hydrologist for the Nebraska Water Science Center uh, with the USGS here in Nebraska. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a project where we're looking at the uh, drought resilience of the Upper South Loop River. Uh, I'm going to be presenting this project on behalf of some of our other, you know, uh, project partners. John Solar, who's with the Utah Water Science Center, who's with USGS there. I also acknowledge a handful of people from our office that contributed towards this project. Corey Devon, uh, Matt Moser, Brent Hall, and Ben Deach. Uh, this project was paid for by a Nebraska Environmental Trust grant, uh, where we partnered with the Lower Loop Natural Resources District and the Upper Loop Natural Resources District. Uh, so within the state of Nebraska, groundwater and surface water are legally recognized as a single resource. Uh, you know, groundwater management decisions are ultimately tied to surface water availability, which is say they're tied to stream flows. So a lot of these natural resource districts uh, across the state and the Department of Natural Resources, you know, they're tasked with managing their systems for stream flow. So they want to limit the amount of groundwater impacts while maintaining the ability to irrigate to kind of maintain, uh, you know, a viable agricultural economy. So a lot of times these water management decisions are made with computer models. Uh, for example, the Elkhorn Loop model or the Central Nebraska Groundwater Flow model. And those are kind of a, a pair of models that are used by our, our project partners for this particular work. All right, thank you. Thank Sorry you about. everybody for your patience. Yes, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Uh, so Loop River Basin, kind of where our project, our study project area is, is a really important hydrologic area for the state. Um, it's located over the thickest parts of the, the high plains of the Ogallah Hawk for, you know, when we kind of think about places in the Upper Loop NRD, particularly Hooker County and Grant County, uh, the saturated thickness can exceed a thousand feet. Uh, and the Nebraska Sandhills is a really important recharge area for the aquifers of our state. You know, it's able to kind of capture and kind of focus on precipitation that falls within an area as a groundwater recharge. And particularly air times of uh, low flows, like literally we saw in, uh, in 2012. Um, oops, excuse me, 2012, the Loop River system is really important, um, really important for you know increasing the flow of the Lower Platte River. You know, a lot of the flow that we see during really low you know, drought years um, is, is largely kind of the result of the you know, uh, Loop River system. But I think intuitively, a lot of us understand this concept, the idea that groundwater and surface water uh, interact with each other. Uh, water is exchanged between streams and aquifers. And there's a couple of different situations that we typically see in the landscape. Um, on the left-hand side, we see a gaining stream. Or in, in that particular case, we have the water table, sur water table surface is higher than that of the stream surface. So water moves from the aquifer and is captured by the stream. And as you move downstream, you increase stream flow or discharge. And that's a situation we have a gaining stream or groundwater discharge. Uh, the opposite can occur, where the water table surface is lower than that of the stream. So the water moves from the stream and replenishes into the aquifer. And so as you move downstream, you decrease in stream flow. Uh, it's considered a losing stream and something called groundwater recharge. Uh, streams within the Loop River Basin typically are gaining streams that they receive groundwater discharge. We studied some of these groundwater discharge characteristics with the, with the previous study in the Loop River Basin. Uh, we used thermal infrared imagery uh, reflected from the air. Uh, to understand the spatial characteristics of groundwater discharge. Uh, we collected that information back in 2015 and 16. 
Gold mill, we looked at all those imagery, we collected up and down the South East River, the Dismal River, and the North East River, and we kind of tied this back to the geology to kind of understand some of these different patterns we saw in the imagery. And I'll show you some of that example imagery right here. Um, so this is going to be some example imagery from the North Fork and the South East River. So this is going to be a little tributary um, in central Logan County uh, that's going to kind of uh, meet up with the South East River um, just east of Stapleton, Nebraska. And kind of what you're seeing in this image is you're seeing these kind of like this, you can kind of make up the trace of that stream, that orangish color. And so the warmer colors indicate warmer stream temperatures. And so we collected these data uh, right before the prior to the onset of ice in, uh, in November. And so those warmer colors indicate warmer temperatures. And you can see the kind of along the margins of the stream, particularly you have breaks and slope. You can see some of these warmer blobs, which are you know locations of groundwater discharge. Uh, so we can see that this little, this little stream, uh, it only runs for about four miles, has a ton of these focused groundwater discharge points in the springs that really increase the flow of that little tributary. If we move a little bit upstream of that, um, kind of more in western Logan County, uh, the South East River is much smaller, kind of this is near the headwaters, and it's kind of really tightly meandering through this kind of uh, like, you know, meadows and rangeland. Um, we can see there's a lot of these in the really focused small springs that kind of uh, sustained flow. In this particular case, the stream is really small. You could like probably step across it. But again, we can see like a really high concentration of uh, some of these different groundwater discharge points. So we look at a map of the stream system that we're interested in. Uh, kind of this upper part of the basin, you know, groundwater discharge is focused, you know, through these quaternary deposits, which is kind of indicates, you know, that's kind of a characterization, you know, relative to those sediments ages, but it really means it's those sufficient deposits of fine sand and silt. That's where that groundwater is upwelling through. As we kind of see those, what those look like in person, here's a couple look at some of the larger springs that we saw in that stream reach. Uh, we can see the kind of kind of upwell through some of this, um, you know, some of these finer you know, below sand, the only and uh, lots and things like that. You can see water crest there, which just kind of indicates that that's, a, that's always discharging, perpetually discharging that paper case. We have kind of an interesting change in the geology as we move downstream, um, roughly just downstream of a, of a stream gauge that we have at Arnold, Nebraska, which is just inside of uh, Custer County. Um, as we move downstream, you can see we've seen like a lot of small focused groundwater discharge points. Now we're seeing a handful of just much larger discharge points that appear to be producing, contributing a lot of stream flow uh, to the south of the river. So we can see that here's some of our imagery. We can see that some of these larger points there um, just to the west. And this is going to be an area that's just going to be eight miles southeast of Arnold, Nebraska. And so kind of as the south of the river flows downstream into Custer County, it incises into these uh, coarser gravel deposits. And they're generally going to be pliocene in age. So if this is kind of what some of those springs look like you know, on the landscape. Uh, you can kind of see the, like the broad exposed sheet of uh, coarse sand and gravel, so these, some of these cobble sides, some stuff as big as your hand. And then this groundwater is just kind of weeping uh, from those exposed deposits and providing quite a bit of flow to the, to the south of the river in this particular case. Now we're simply kind of learned from and map with that aerial thermal infrared image. So some of that initial find, some of the major finds from that initial, uh, initial bit of work, you know, about 40% of the flow that we've measured at the stream gauge at Arnold, Nebraska, originates from that really small tributary of uh, North Fork of the South Oak River. You know, during periods of high groundwater demand, you know, summer months when people are typically irrigating their crops, uh, stream flow is greatest near Pressy Park, which is going to be uh, just on Highway 21 south of Broken Bow, which have central uh, Custer County. We have the highest stream flow that we have in, that, in the South Oak River system at Pressy Park during these periods of in late summer. And that stream flow generally remains, remains steady or decreases as we move. Uh, towards our downstream gauge at that Michael, so just above the mouth where the, the south is meets up with the middle in Buffalo County. That initial piece of work, you know, kind of answered a lot of questions and kind of these kind of these patterns of groundwater discharge and how these, you know, how the upper loop NRD and the lower loop NRD might you know, kind of cooperatively manage their systems. But there's still some correct, uh, questions that remain. Uh, one of those questions was how would the uh, how would the stream flow of the South Loop River be affected by a multi-year drought? So kind of we're thinking about that drought in 2012 that really was uh, uh, really impactful and had a lot of, kind of detrimental effects. You know, what would happen if we repeated that, uh, that drought a couple of years or three years in a row? And do the base flow characteristics change along certain regions of the South Loop River? You know, people want to kind of understand what's the resilience of base flow uh, along these different regions of the South Loop River. Just because it might, uh, different NRDs and different locations might have to you know, have different management strategies to kind of maintain uh, stream flow during particular periods. So to kind of answer some of those questions, I'm going to introduce a few concepts here. Uh, the first one is going to be groundwater residence time. Uh, generally, what that is, it's going to be defined as the length of time that water remains in an aquifer as a you know, parcel of water 
uh, travels from a recharge area, so it's some kind of area remote from a discharge area. It might be like a hilltop or somewhere away from a stream. What's the length of time it travels from a recharge area to a discharge area? In this particular case, that's either going to be a, a spring or, or the South Loop River. And depending on where this is all occurring and kind of what, what kind of landscape we're thinking about, um, how the system is plumbed or configured, this can vary on the order from days or thousands of years. The discharge water with a longer residence time will generally produce steadier, more consistent flow. This is the same the climatic variability that you see in year to year, the change in precipitation. A lot of those effects are, you know, are going to be dampened out. Groundwater residence time is something we can estimate with groundwater age tracers. Uh, groundwater age tracers, that's um, generally what that, what that indicates is this kind of set of compounds or constituents that we can sample for in groundwater. We collect water samples for them. So we can kind of like, you know, uh, quantify the concentration and we can kind of roughly equate that to a groundwater age or a groundwater residence time. Uh, generally speaking, the concentration of these things, these groundwater tracers, uh, is really well characterized and it varies over time. When we, kind of, when we kind of think of groundwater tracers as a whole, we kind of put them in two kind of general buckets. Uh, we have the set of young tracers, so the, the set of things that we can sample for that are generally, um, you know, that's going to identify or quantify the age of groundwater that's been recharged, say, like after 1950. Uh, including this uh, set of young tracers, things we get like tritium. That's going to be a radioactive isotope of hydrogen. We're looking at the actual hydrogen molecule or hydrogen atom within a water molecule. We're going to Quantify or characterize the uh, amount of tritium in that, in that water sample. Um, there's also, we can look at sulfur hexafluoride, which is an industrial gas that we can look at. And then uh, the other set of tracers that we use are, is uh, carbon 14. So you've probably seen um, different uh, you know, documentaries, say like Matt Geo or Discovery Channel, we're looking at like you know, carbon 14 dating to look at different archaeological artifacts. But well, we can do the same thing with groundwater uh, by looking at the carbon 14 of the you know, dissolved inorganic carbon in the groundwater sample. So here's a quick graph to kind of kind of illustrate that that point. Uh, we've got a, a kind of a concentration over time for a couple different tracers. So on the horizontal axis, you're seeing uh, the year from 1940 to past 2000, and then you're seeing on the vertical axis, you know, a measure of concentration. Uh, so you can see this tritium, which is going to be that that blue trace there. We can see a, you know, it's kind of spiky, but it really increases, and there's a peak about 1962, and that was kind of in response to the, all the thermal nuclear weapons testing that's been taking place. Uh, through the 50s and 60s that really kind of um, increased the amount of tritium in the atmosphere and the tritium in precipitation. Uh, SF6 you know has a little bit different uh, curve or signature. Uh, so basically that's that's an industrial gas that's released in the atmosphere and in response to the production of electrical transmission equipment. So that's a really good tracer if you're looking at things that are have recharged after 1980. So each one of these tracers kind of has its own uh, place in terms of uh, you know, dating things past 1950. So it's ideally kind of you want to apply a set of tracers to kind of uh, understand the, you know, the age of certain groundwater samples. So groundwater, you know, we, when we get these results back from uh, from the lab, you know, lots, oftentimes we're dealing with a, you know, a mean age, groundwater age. And so that's going to be kind of an average age for that entire water sample. Uh, you know, water samples, particularly ones that are collecting at springs or near, near streams or these different discharge points, they're often made of varying ages. So that you can imagine that the, the flow path from different, uh, you know, kind of that groundwater resonance figure, the flow path is often integrating, kind of converging uh, near these discharge areas. So you have different ages kind of uh, within one particular water sample. Uh, Tracer LPM, which is a USGS program, you know, effectively it's this, this Excel workbook. Um, so it, basically what it does is it uses all these different, uses information from several tracers and helps you partition the, the ages of a, of a water sample and a mixed water sample. Is really understanding kind of understanding the relative contribution of young water versus old water in particular water samples. Help you kind of better understand and uh, characterize groundwater residents. Uh, one more concept I want to put in there is a susceptibility index. Uh, so the susceptibility index kind of as it's you know routinely defined, it's this quantitative measure of how vulnerable a well, a groundwater well is to surface contamination. Uh, we're not really necessarily interested or focused on groundwater quality in this particular study. Uh, so we're going to be kind of using that metric kind of in a different context. In this particular case, we're looking at, um, you know, this particular case, we're going to look at more of the uh, vulnerability to, you know, short-term conditions of, you know, climatic variability. Um, so kind of you know, one thing I just want to make sure I leave you with, it's a unitless value that ranges from zero to one. So values in this particular case that are code to zero, uh, they indicate an old water sample with a very broad or mixed age distribution. Um, so we have these values that are closer to zero, those are going to be less vulnerable to drought conditions. So I just kind of remember that key concept. 
if you have a value of one, that indicates the water table is a mean age of one year and a very narrow uh, rent, narrow age distribution. In that particular case, it's going to be much more vulnerable to short term drought conditions. We want to discuss our overall groundwork sampling approach. Um, so, in the summer of 2019, we collected uh, 20 different samples from wells and springs in the Southwood River, uh, upstream from Presley Park. So, everything kind of like from central Custer County west towards the headwaters of Logan County. Um, we determined the mean age and the age distribution using the Tracer LPM workbook. Uh, we also calculated the susceptibility index and compared these different results from different sampling points um, from wells and springs in the quaternary deposits. So that's so official deposits in the headwaters of the South Wood River, uh, this coarser placing uh, gravel deposits in uh, some of the deeper wells in the overall formation of the spring. So this slide kind of describes the different constituents we sampled for. In addition to the age tracers, uh, we collected the data on major ions, so things like calcium, carbon, and chloride. Um, so basically, we use these to identify the relative contribution of these like kind of major ions. Um, it helps us identify the these major water types and kind of like a geochemical fingerprint for different samples. Uh, we kind of take that information, kind of examine you know, with these sets of samples and think about mixing between aquifers and mixing with surface water. Uh, we also collected uh, samples for nutrients, so things like nitrate and phosphate. Um, so those are largely, if we have high concentrations of nitrate, those are generally going to be the result of uh, agricultural activities. It also kind of gives us a little bit more information in, in that it's indicative of post-1960 water when uh, these commercial fertilizers were first applied to, to, uh, to agricultural fields. Oh, uh, we also collected stable isotopes. So, if you remember from the high school chemistry class, that uh, a water molecule is two hydrogens and one oxygen. Um, and each one of those uh, hydrogen and oxygen atoms has a natural um, stable isotope that doesn't break down. Uh, so, basically, you have these kind of slightly heavier water molecules. And those are going to kind of behave a little bit different in the hydrologic system. So, we're looking at these ratios of heavier isotopes of hydrogen or oxygen. Uh, in that water molecule. And kind of that ratio becomes kind of a fingerprint for a parcel of water. Kind of ultimately what this does is kind of help us identify a recharge source and timing of recharge. We'll talk a little bit about that a little bit about, uh, later in the talk. And also, of course, we collected for age as well. So here's a map that kind of shows our, our, our groundwater sample locations. Uh, we collected a handful of samples. Um, oops. We collected a handful of samples um, from these paternity deposits can be indicated by these red squares. Those are going to be generally our shallow wells. Uh, we collected a handful of samples from these placing deposits. Those are going to be our springs, uh, where that placing gravel is discharging water to the Southwood River. And that's going to be kind of primarily downstream of that Arnold stream gauge, uh, which is indicated here by this uh, green square. Uh, we also collected a handful of samples from the deeper overall wells, which is indicated by the, uh, the blue triangle. So those are going to be some of our deeper wells uh, across our city. But generally, all of our sampling points are very close to the Southwood River and kind of span everywhere from upstream from the stream gauge uh, at Crescent Park, uh, all, all the way to headwaters of Oakland County. Uh, also, we did some continuous water quality monitoring as part of this work to kind of supplement or kind of support some of the interpretations we had from our, our groundwater sampling. Um, you might not be familiar with continuous water quality monitoring is, but it's a continuous measurement of certain or key water quality parameters. So generally, we stick a probe or kind of a son, which is a set of probes in a stream, and we continuously measure water temperature, dissolved oxygen, specific conductance, which is kind of the uh, amount of dissolved solids um, in a stream or, or, or in the groundwater. And we can even continuously measure things like nitrate. Uh, typically, we, we've got a handful of these out, you know, on, ongoing right now. We collect this data typically at stream gauges, but we can also collect them in wells or springs. And primarily, the focus is on water quality studies, but we uh, kind of put this put forth on this to kind of more study, um, provide a little more supporting information for our age trace requirements. We collected, we had three different sites that we instrumented with uh, where we collected continuous water temperature, specific inductance, and gauge height, which is kind of the height of the spring, you know, the, the, pot, the pool or the, uh, uh, the water surface that springs or the different streams. Uh, we also collected discrete uh, stream flow or discharge measurements during our site visits, um, servicing that song and calibrating. Only this what this continuous information is going to let us know is understanding how these springs respond or how the stream responds to uh, precipitation events or persistent dry conditions. So it kind of gives a little more information, a little more softer information about how the you know how this uh, system responds to different hydrologic stresses. So we're kind of in a dry period right now in, two, in 2022. Um, but if you kind of remember back to 2019, things were quite a bit different. 
Um, that was a particularly white year. We had a number of white years in a row. 2019 was kind of the kind of cherry on top, so to speak. Um, you know, typically in our study area, it's a broken bow, about 23.6 inches per year is kind of considered normal. Stapleton further to the west, a little bit less precipitation, 23 inches. Um, however, in 2019, we got a heck of a lot more water than that, more precipitation than that. Um, generally, on, within our study year, we had about 150 to 140 percent, you know, percent of normal uh, precipitation that particular year. Uh, so a couple of things with that, it made uh, data collection and field work a lot more challenging. We had a lot of kind of difficulty getting back to some of these streams or some of these different areas. Uh, actually, we were actually as we were sampling, we we're kind of being chased off by storms and lightning and things like that. Um, and it also kind of like we kind of had that needed to that in mind as we kind of looked through and kind of interpreted our results as well. So it made data collection a little bit more challenging, particularly when we talk, talk about the previous water quality measurements. Uh, but also we. You know, at the end of this thing, we got a pretty good data, so they kind of make some good comparisons and have some good insights. You know, at least they got that. We're going to kind of shift gears and think about uh, you know results interpretations. I'm going to provide a little bit of a discussion of the uh, kind of general geochemistry from our different uh, groundwater quality samples. Uh, we're going to look at the age and water quality characteristics from the groundwater of the sample that these quaternary wells. Uh, we're going to do the kind of same discussion for these different biasing springs as well. And we're going to look at the age and water quality characteristics of the overall the wells. And we're going to look at kind of wrap things up with some reach, reach scale stream flow comparisons. We had a little bit of stream flow data. We're going to try to make some statements about um, under, how resilient the system is to, to wrap different reaches of the study. So, first, we're going to talk about the water quality and you know, the water type. Uh, that plot you're seeing on the right hand side, that's something that's called a, a piper plot. And generally, what that indicates to us is we, we come get these. Water quality sample results and identify the concentrations of magnesium, calcium, chloride, sulfate, those types of things, which are considered our major ions. Uh, basically, what we do is we kind of normalize them based on their atomic weight and then give us an idea of the kind of the relative contribution of each one of these different ions in that particular water sample. And we kind of see in this Piper plot that all of our samples kind of are clustered together on different parts of this plot. And generally, that indicates to us that we have a very, we have a calcium bicarbonate water type, which is typical for. Uh, groundwater samples collected in the high plains of the overall aquifer. Our total dissolved solids are generally less than 500 milligrams per liter, so it's really good, high quality of water. Uh, nitrate concentrations for 85% of 17 of those samples were below 3 milligrams per liter. Uh, generally, that points to is that, but by and large, all the samples that we collected, you know, the groundwater is not um, impacted uh, by land use activities or intensive agricultural activities. So this is a, a plot that shows our uh, some of our stable isotope information. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the kind of the relative contribution, relative ratio of the O18 on the horizontal axis uh, relative to a standard. And whereas on the vertical axis, you're seeing the um, uh, ratio of the uh, deuterium, which is the hydrogen isotope on the vertical axis. And kind of what you see is that horizontal, that black line that goes from the lower left to the upper right. That is kind of the approximation of the isotope ratios of hydrogen and oxygen for local precipitation. And that was measured at based on precipitation samples uh, collected along the North Platte. So you can see a lot of our samples kind of spread along that uh, what's called a local meteoric water line. So if we have samples that are kind of plotting more in the bottom left hand part of this plot, and it's more isotopically plated, is how we refer to that. Generally, that means we have recharge, more the recharge we're getting from that particular water sample is from wintertime precipitation. So generally, uh, snow melt or cooler, kind of those cooler season months. Oops. And we have, uh, if we get a water sample that's more on the upper right hand part of this plot, uh, generally that indicates that we have more of that recharge coming from more of a summertime, summertime signal. Uh, so you're seeing some of these samples to kind of naturally kind of cluster together. Um, generally indicates to us that you might have things like irrigation return flow, so the water that's pumped in uh, pivots during the growing season, and that's providing us more of a, a high proportion of recharge on the signals. And we'll kind of get back to that theme a little bit later on this talk when we discuss some of these different uh, things. So we'll kind of discuss uh, the groundwater quality results from our quaternion deposits. So it's going to be indicated by the, the red squares here. Uh, so that's a map of our sample wells that we had. You know, we kind of range from uh, near headwaters of South Loop River and further downstream east of all of Nebraska. Uh, so the, the mean groundwater age for those samples uh, ranged from 27 to 2100 years old. We had a pretty good spread, two orders of magnitude. Uh, with respect to the groundwater age and groundwater wetness time. Uh, so separately index values range from 0.04 to 0.37. So again, another order of magnitude range there. 
So it's kind of interesting that we have this big kind of broad range, even though we have very reflecting groundwater samples from very shallow deposits. And when we kind of think about where these uh, sampling locations are located on the landscape, we kind of think about um, kind of the topography and study area. Uh, if, we, if we had a well or a, a sample that we collected near a discharge area, so that's something that's collected very close to the south of the river, uh, we have a number of these different flow paths that are converging. Uh, generally, in, in that particular situation, we had a, an older mean age and a lower susceptibility index for those, for those samples collected in that area. However, if we collect the samples in these recharge areas, which is going to be kind of a shallow water table, kind of away from the stream, where groundwater is just basically kind of capturing just that recent recharge. Excuse me. Generally speaking, those samples had a younger mean age, a higher susceptibility index. Uh, so they also had higher concentrations of protozoal solids and chloride. So generally, that indicates to us that uh, these areas are going to be younger and they're going to be kind of tend to be more impacted by agricultural land use activities in those, in those cases. We're going to look at our continuous water quality information. We had two sites that were uh, kind of focused on looking at groundwater discharge from these uh, shallower quaternary deposits. Uh, we had one spring that was located just west of Arnold, Nebraska. So you can kind of see this little seep that's coming through here, and it's the water that's kind of discharging to this really fine grain silt just west of town there. Uh, we're also looking at the south of the river just below the confluence of the north Fork. Uh, so unfortunately we weren't able to back up in that picture that you're seeing that kind of the upper left. Um, you know the north fork south is a really kind of marshy area. We get a lot of groundwater kind of coming in and then in 2019 it just you know flooded a lot of this low-lying uh, range like there so we weren't able to kind of get back there uh, to do a lot of that. So we set up our monitoring station Kind of at a county road bridge, um, just below the confluence, of, up below the, of the North Fork River. So it's more curious of that information here. So here's a plot that was collected just west of Arm, Nebraska, that smaller spring that I showed you on the, the right hand side of the previous uh, slide. And so this plot is showing on the horizontal axis, we got our date. So this is going to show you about two weeks worth of data. And on the left hand vertical axis, we're looking at gauge height. So that's going to be the height of the water level surface as we go take. And on the right hand vertical axis, we're looking at specific inductance, which gives you an idea of the uh, amount of total resolved solids in, in the water, uh, in, the, in that spring water. And so on the, the blue trace is going to be our gauge height. So as we have rainfall event, we had a big rainfall event about the 15th of August that produces really, really rapid, high response in gauge height. So the spring, the, the spring came up quite a good ways. It kind of receded uh, down there. And we almost have this mirrored response with specific inductance. So you're kind of seeing some of those ions that are in, typically in the groundwater being diluted by recent precipitation. Uh, specific conductance remain low after the recession. So, you know, uh, we had specific conductance that remain kind of below kind of our base level of 500 uh, microsiemens per centimeter uh, after the gauge height or the flow had receded. So generally that indicates to us we have groundwater discharge plus surface runoff. Uh, you know, the groundwater discharge in this particular case is uh, surface runoff uh, with recent precipitation. So generally indicates very young water in that particular system with discharge into the river. And we have a, you know, as we kind of move further west uh, to our side that's on the south of the river, just below the confluence of the North Fork. Um, in this particular case, we're looking at an entire season's worth of data. So if you look at the horizontal axis, this goes from uh, about May of 2019 all the way through October 2019. And so we can see some of these larger uh, rises in gauge height. And that's going to be on your oh, the right hand vertical axis here. Uh, we can see these larger rises in gauge height. They coincide with generally uh, large increases in specific conductance. You know, gauge height and specific conductance largely near each other. It's kind of the opposite relationship uh, that we had in our previous site. You can imagine that's, that picture I showed you, that kind of low lying rangeland as that water. You have this increased precipitation, you have rising groundwater levels. It's mobilizing these ions that are accumulating below the root zone, those different uh, uh, that's the, you know, the plants on the rate zone there. So in this particular case, you have increased specific inductance, so higher more dissolved solids that are caused by uh, increases in groundwater discharge. So if you have increases in groundwater discharge, you have higher stream conductivity. So it's kind of a unique relationship that we saw at this particular site. You kind of superimpose on that kind of broad kind of uh, pattern you see some of these drops in specific inductance when you have really intense rainfall events uh, that fell on the land surface that are kind of diluting some of that groundwater discharge. So we're going to look at our kind of move a little bit further downstream and look, look, look a little bit deeper in the subsurface here and look at the uh, groundwater age of our quality characteristics from our Pliocene age wells and springs. Uh, so we collected samples from two different wells and eight springs uh, that you've seen here mapped on the, on the right hand side. And we kind of split those out into two different groups. Uh, we have this Western Pliocene group, 
So that's going to be the orange dot that you're seeing at this uh, this location here, kind of in the uh, a little bit northwest, northwestern part of this uh, part of the map. Uh, generally speaking, if you were to kind of like just kind of broadly characterize the water quality characteristics, uh, generally those samples had higher concentrations of chloride, they had high concentrations of nitrate, and they had uh, generally high, uh, you know, the carbon 14 values had high percentages of modern carbon, which is to say they were young, on by and large, uh, younger water. So we're going to look at a, a, a plot that was created here. So on the horizontal axis, you're looking at carbon 14 and percent modern carbon. So if you have high percentages of modern carbon, you know, kind of around 100, that's generally indicate you have a very young water sample. Uh, on the vertical axis, you're seeing uh, chloride concentrations and milligrams per liter. As we kind of made, made that particular plot, our samples kind of naturally kind of cluster together. That Western Pleistocene sample group generally had higher concentrations of chloride, and it's more modern carbon in that particular case. And if you look at our Pleistocene sample group, which is just a little bit further downstream in our system, uh, generally speaking, they have lower concentrations of chloride, uh, and nitrate, and they kind of just uh, a lower percentage of modern carbon that's considered uh, considered old. So within a Western Pleistocene age sample group, the stuff these orange dots here, um, closest to Arnold, Nebraska, the mean age of those samples range from 18 to 77 years. Uh, the susceptibility index values range from 0 0.1, 0 0.1, excuse me, 0.148 to 0 0.257. Uh, generally speaking, these these samples had high nitrate. A couple of these uh, exceeded the M EPA MCL 10 milligrams per liter, so they had pretty high concentration of nitrate. Uh, and there's slight enrichment of oxygen 18. So they kind of plot in that upper right hand part of that plot. And those are going to be largely going to be in the effects of intensive groundwater irrigation. So you had higher, uh, more recharge occurring in the summer months for those particular samples. And if we kind of think about the regional groundwater flow direction, which is going to be east, a little bit northeast, the likely recharge area for, uh, for those for that is the water that's discharging the east springs. There's going to be this uh, area that's going to be indicated by these pivot circles, um, in really intensely cropped or heavily irrigated areas here in the west and south. Area. If we move a little bit further downstream, the splicing sample groups so are just a few miles downstream. Uh, we see totally different geochemical and age characteristics. Uh, the mean ages of these particular groundwater samples range from 1200 to 6700 years. Uh, the springs that we collected range from 1900 to 2900 years old. Uh, generally, in this particular case, we're looking at a mixture of modern water that's recharged after 1950 and pre modern waters. This will be a mixed water sample. Uh, Susceptibility so index values approach zero and range up to 0.23. Uh, generally speaking, these, uh, these samples have low concentrations of chloride, nitrate, and they also have high concentrations of silica, which is uh, kind of the importance of the kind of context of that is if you have samples that have high concentrations of silica, it generally indicates you have a longer contact time with the Aquifer sediments, which generally results in uh, more dissolved silicon. So, the likely recharge area, we kind of think about the regional groundwater flow direction, is this kind of outlier of this kind of this, this patch of healing and sand dunes in the southwest. That's going to be largely uh, what we're identifying as the uh, you know, groundwater recharge area uh, for those springs. Um, so we're looking at our continuous water quality information. Um, we have one site that was set up. Uh, draining a couple different springs that we sampled with uh, that previous set of sampling results I mentioned. Uh, so the spring 30 that's coming in here off the right hand side of this, that bottom, bottom left uh, photograph, and then spring 27, which is kind of discharging an area uh, on the upper left hand of that bottom left part of the photograph as well. So we're showing us uh, kind of a similar plot that we sh showed before, and that we have we're looking at that same storm event um, in August. We're looking at about two weeks of data on the horizontal axis. Left hand vertical axis, we're looking at gauge height. Um, so, this is going to be in feet. And on the right hand vertical axis, we're looking at specific inductance uh, from about 0 to 250 uh, microsiemens per centimeter along that, along that axis. So we can see that rainfall does produce a uh, really rapid increase in gauge height, but um, only just a couple tenths of a foot. So, really small, uh, a small increase relative uh, to, to that other sampling location or that other monitoring location. And it does show an immediate drop in specific inductance. But by and large, we're looking at this information. It looks like we have very little variation of stage, uh, not much variation of flow, even though we had a really wet, uh, wet summer in that particular year, and then very little change in specific conductance. And the only way that indicates to us is it you know, kind of makes the case that very steady, consistent flow, uh, you know, consistent with a you know groundwater discharge with a wide age distribution. So in this particular case, you know, groundwater sampling results and continuous water quality monitoring results really agree well with each other. So we look at the some of the water age and water quality information from some of the deeper wells in the sample as part of this project. So this can be 
uh, water samples collected in the Ogallala Formation. Uh, mean ages for those samples range from 8,700 to 23,000 years ago. Uh, susceptibility index values are poke zero, so very low, so 0.012 to 0.02. But generally speaking, these samples, as you might imagine, have very low concentrations of nitrate, uh, chloride, but high concentrations of silica, indi indicating that we, we have a, a long time contact time with the set. So near the South Loop River, you know, generally we had a pair of monitoring wells uh, that were completed, you know, near the stream here. Um, generally speaking, we had um, the water level that me was measured in that overall, that deeper overall well, the well uh, stream deeper within the aquifer at a water level surface that was much higher than the stream surface of the South Loop River. And groundwater flows from areas of high pressure, so high water levels, uh, to areas of low pressure. So generally that indicates to us we have a water level that's higher in the well than above the river. Uh, groundwater is going to be moving from the aquifer into the river in that particular case. So these strong upward gradients at these wells indicates to us that water from the deeper Ogallala is going to be discharged into the South Loop River. Uh, so the kind of last topic I'm going to leave you, leave you with here is we did some reach scale stream flow comparisons. Uh, so stream flow in the data within the South Loop River Basin is really limited. You know, we kind of think about other basins within the state that are um, like, like the Platte River or say the Republican River. You know, they've got decades and decades of stream flow data, a lot of information collected about them. Uh, our kind of the South Loop River that's only kind of recently emerged as a, a stream of kind of concern in terms of water management. And so we don't really have any data, you know, Kind of upper reach so only for about 10 years with the data, uh, stream flow data at all. Uh, so we did a comparison to area normalized stream flow, which is uh, just kind of a term that means we take the stream flow that we measure in cubic feet per second and we divide it by the drainage area. So kind of what we're doing is we're identifying how much stream flow that each square mile of that basin is contributing to the stream. So we made a comparison to the North Fork South Loop River and then the South Loop River uh, on some stream flow measurements in 2015 and 2019. And we also looked at the uh, information collected in different stream gauges, the one that's collected at the South Loop River Arnold, uh, which is kind of draining this area that's draining or um, collecting groundwater discharge with return deposits and shallower sediments. And then we looked at Fessy Park as well, which is going to be a little bit further downstream. And that's going to be an area that's going to be uh, you know, picking up a lot of that groundwater discharge from these coarser uh, Fice and Nation pockets. So we kind of make a comparison of the Upper South Loop and the North Fork South Loop River. Uh, the area normalized stream flow of the North Fork and the South Loop ranged from about 0.31 to 0.46 uh, cubic feet per second per square mile. Uh, so generally what that means is like every, for every square mile of the North Fork South Loop Basin, it was producing 0.31 or 0.46 cubic feet per second of stream flow. If we kind of compare that with the upper South Loop River, uh, it's going to be contributing about 0.014 to 0.05 cubic feet per second per square mile. Uh, if we look at typical sand hills rivers, so things like the Dismal River, the North Fork River, or the Middle Loop River, the North Loop River, the Middle Loop River. Uh, typically, late, they're going to contribute about 0.16 to 0.3 cubic uh, feet per second per square mile, which is kind of interesting. Um, we, excuse me. Let me go back here. So, which is kind of interesting in the sense that we like the North Fork South Loop River is almost doubling that what we consider a typical St. Louis stream. Uh, kind of what that indicates to us that the the North Fork and South Loop River might be kind of intercepting groundwater discharge and other surface water. Uh, in the and so we're now we're going to look at some three scale stream flow comparisons of, of the South Loop River uh, measured recorded at the stream gauge at Arnold and Crescent Park uh, from May of 2019 to October 2019. Uh, if we look at some of the you know, area normalized stream flow of Arnold, uh, these areas that are draining these paternity deposits, uh, they range from typically they are average around 0.05. Uh, cubic feet per second per square mile. I will move downstream towards Crescent Park. Uh, that increased to 0.2 cubic feet per square mile. So that suggests that the South Loop River, upstream of Crescent Park, in fact, within that reach between Crescent and Arnold, is likely much more drought and drain compared to the, you know, the upper uh, upstream of Arnold. So some of the significant findings of this work uh, you know, well screened and corner, paternity deposits indicated a mix of ages, which is a mixed index values. If we had a groundwater samples collected in these recharge areas, they're going to be, going to be younger, have a higher susceptibility index, and more sensitive to climatic changes. However, if we collect groundwater samples in these closer to discharge areas, generally speaking, they're going to be lower, have a lower susceptibility index value, and less sensitive to climatic change. Uh, these Pleistocene age wells and springs, so you have these areas that are downgraded of intensive groundwater irrigation. Generally, those have to be, generally, those can be younger groundwater samples with higher susceptibility index values. However, with 
we were within that area of downgrade of the Eolian dunes, it's generally going to be a mixture of older and younger waters. So we're going to be more tolerant to less sensitive than climatic change. So we have a comparison of our discharge unit it indicates that the, uh, you know, the area that was upstream of Arnold Stream Gauge is going to be more vulnerable to drought conditions. Uh, well screen the overall formation, generally having the oldest mean ages with a very broad ditch distribution. Uh, water levels paired from paired wells indicate that we have a substantial amount of groundwater discharge from the OR to the south. Uh, I don't know that we kind of deliver this, some of these roles to the water managers in the upper and, and lower and natural resource districts. Hopefully, giving them a little bit more, you know, a little bit more stand on, which makes them defensible groundwater management decisions. Hopefully, anticipate the effects and kind of mitigate the effects of a multi year drought. So with that, I can open up to any questions that anyone has. So fascinating. I am obsessed. Um, so yeah, go ahead. If anybody has any questions, pop them into the chat and Chris can answer. Um, I'll put up the poll for us in just a moment, but I also have a couple of questions. Um, so I know that we're in a severe drought currently in Nebraska still, correct? Yeah, it's kind of, you know, we're kind of trending in that direction, I guess. Um, I think right now we're typically most of the states in a moderate, let's consider a moderate yeah. drought, drought monitor. You know, things are maybe a little bit easier, a little bit uh, not quite as bad as in eastern Nebraska. So we kind of tip one of two ways, I think, going into, going into the summer. So. Um, what do you think? So, like, as a whole, you kind of said that right now we think resilience is pretty good for like the older um, sections and then like lower sector, the younger sections have a little bit like more susceptibility to dramatic, like climatic variability. Um, what are some things that the state of Nebraska is doing to like improve resilience currently outside of like doing studies like these? Is there like statewide management currently? I mean, so, so the Department of Natural Resources, they work with these, you know, local NRD natural resource districts. And I think that the biggest thing that sets, you know, if you look at the High Plains Oxford stretches from Nebraska to Texas, so the Northern High Plains where we sit in Nebraska, you know, we're, we, we manage our systems based on stream flow. So um, we're, we're, that's kind of suggests that we have a very sustainable use of the system for not every part of the state, but a good part of the state. Yeah. Uh, so generally, if you're kind of managing by stream flow and you're kind of using that as the pulse of which you're, you're making your decisions, um, that kind of sets you ahead in terms of Kansas or Texas where you're just kind of managing depletions. Yeah. And kind of setting a, I don't know, a life expectancy, for lack of a better term, of, of the aquifer. You're just trying to, they're trying to milk, they're just trying to milk it as long as they can, they're effectively mining groundwater. Uh, whereas, you know, places in Nebraska were generally were just fairly sustainable, managed fairly sustainably. Um, that's not to say if that long, more long term climatic changes might affect that relationship, we might have to kind of change, you know, change how practices are happening. But by and large, particularly when you look at the Loop River system, it's you have the up the sand hills are kind of at the upper basin, capturing all this recharge. Providing a huge amount of stream flow in that part of the state, you know they're pretty, they're pretty well situated, I guess, in terms of water resources. Nice. Um, and then I know that we talk a lot about dramatic events as far as like rainfall and stuff like that continuing to happen with like climate change and things of that nature. How would you like? How severely will those dramatic like rainfall events affect outside of like testing? Does that affect resilience at all, or? So, I mean, I think um, initially there was the kind of the uh, motivation for the study. They identified these different tributaries of the South River, and I think they were going to, they wanted to capture some of these big you know, rainfall events, these big runoff events, capture it behind, say, like a dam or kind of check it up, and then release it downstream when it's needed at different periods of the year. That was kind of an idea. Um, they kind of explored that a little bit and just wasn't going to provide the amount of flow that they needed. But I think that's, I think people are always looking for ways to, you know, try to capture some trying to try to make use of those big rainfall yeah. events. Um, so kind of an example of that is like you know the North Platte River Valley in you know kind of around Scotts Bluff and that area. Um, you know they had a lot of flow in like 2013 there's a lot of water uh, coming through the North Platte and especially in the South Platte system. So they took water, diverted it, all that you know flood water diverted it in some of these irrigation canals and kind of stopped it, you know, kind of dammed the water of these irrigation canals just for intentional recharge. Yeah. Where the infrastructure is in place, you can kind of make use of some of those higher flows to kind of for intentional recharge. Which is so, so cool. It's so cool. 
Well, I don't see any questions popping up right now. I'm gonna go ahead and send out our poll real quick. Um, and then as always, if you are interested in more events like this, you can always check our Facebook page. We've got lots of stuff upcoming. The summer gets very populated with webinars and in-person opportunities. Um, and then upon the end of this, remember that the posting will be posted in a couple of weeks to our YouTube channel. So you can always watch back or send it to your friends. And then I'll also follow up um, with just some reminders um, at the end and send everybody just a follow up email. So do you have any other last minute things you want to say, Chris? Uh, not at the moment, just thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Appreciate being able to talk to, a, you know, kind of a new set of folks, I guess. And kind of just uh, let everyone know the kind of science and USU is doing across the state. So appreciate it. Thanks for the invite. It was so cool. I also, going forward, I definitely have kids on campus that would be interested in hearing about something like this too. So I'll have to, there's a conservation group that I'm a part of that everybody's obsessed with groundwater right now. So mm -hmm. it's becoming like a massive, I don't want to say like a trend on campus, but all of a sudden everybody wants to be a hydrologist, which is like exciting to watch. So you are very smart and they would love to listen to you talk. So. All right. Very good. Very good. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. So hard doing all this on my phone. I've never done it before. And all right, I will chat with you soon. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.